The 19th cassette of this Bible study series brings you Dr. Howard C. E. Stepp, President of World Prophetic Ministry Incorporated, who will teach two lessons from the book of Genesis. In the beautiful King is Coming Auditorium at Colton, California, Dr. E. Stepp is now beginning his verse-by-verse -verse lesson from Genesis chapter 41, verse 8. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 41, and we're calling this section or series of messages, Bible studies, exploring in Genesis. In fact, that's what we're doing because I have really never studied the book of Genesis on a verse-by-verse -verse basis before in all of my 40-year-plus ministry. So I'm enjoying it, and I'm just excited with what I'm learning, what I'm getting acquainted with, and I find that as I'm studying Genesis verse by verse, when I make my telecasts, I have so many reserved little phrases and situations that come to my mind I never had before. And it all comes to me because I'm studying the Bible verse by verse. And if I was going to make a recommendation to anybody, especially a young family starting out, I would suggest, hardly recommend, that they make a life goal of going through the Bible together verse by verse. Believe me, my friends, it will pay off in multiplicity of dividends the like you'll never experience in all of your life. It's a marvelous experience to go through the Bible verse by verse, mark it, underline it. If you would come and look at my Bible, you would see that it's just filled with marks. I mark all over it, underline it, and cross-reference it. I don't worry about it. It's a tool. It's not a, a sacred book that I don't want anybody to touch or anything like that. I'm not treating it in that sense, though I accept the Bible as a sacred book. But I'm using this book to fill my head and my heart and my mind with knowledge of God Almighty and a history of what God has done down through the ages of time with mankind. In chapter 41, verses 8 through 36, we have a lesson outline, and I only have two parts tonight. One, interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. That's verses 8 through 24. Number two, Joseph gives the interpretation, verses 25 through 36. So we're only going to do from verse 8 through 36, two parts. In our last lesson, we saw that uh, Pharaoh had two dreams. Now, the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams is picked up in verse 8 through 24. Verse 8 says, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. God was causing the spirit of Pharaoh to be troubled. He's going to reveal to Joseph, as in the case of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, God is causing his spirit to be troubled because uh, God has a man in jail in, uh, in Egypt that God wants to use. So this man, Pharaoh, we see that his spirit was troubled in the middle of verse 8, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. These are the magic people. These are the fellows who are professional priests, and they are men who are gifted with understanding the stars and the planets and the signs and all of that kind of business, the solar system. So he's troubled. He had these dreams, two of them, in verses 1 through 7. Now he's involved in a quandary. He doesn't know what to do. So the middle of verse 8, he sends for all of his magicians, all of the intellectuals of Egypt and all the wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Now, we had this same thing happen over in the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he couldn't remember the dream, and he called his wise men and all of the soothsayers and the astrologers and these people who seem to have the knack of knowing everything and not knowing anything, and they came in and they said, nobody can do this. But God had a man there in Babylon by the name of Daniel. 
You see, God always has a man. God has a person. God has a solution. God has the answer to all of the problems and all of the questions. We just have to be patient. So these uh, wise men could not interpret this dream or dreams of Pharaoh. Verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Now, this butler, you remember, he had a covenant or made an agreement with, with uh, Joseph that when the butler got out of jail and got elevated back to his original position, he had made some kind of a homemade agreement with Joseph. He said, now, when I get back in the palace, I'm going to remember you. But when he got back in the palace, he forgot Joseph. And Joseph is sitting in jail, rotting away. Now, you see, God wants to get Joseph out of jail, but he's going to do it in a natural sort of way. So what's he going to do? Verse 9, well, the butler remembers Joseph. He says, I do, rem I do remember my faults this day. Verse 10, Pharaoh was, and this is the butler talking, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. So the butler is uh, reminding Pharaoh what happened previously, verse 11. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he, the butler and the baker. We both dreamed a dream. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. In other words, the dream that we dreamed was interpreted by this man, and it came to pass according to the interpretation that this man who was in jail the same time as I was interpreted my dream. Now notice what he's saying. Verse 12, And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. Rather interesting, verse 13. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Now, you see, Joseph is being remembered. He wasn't remembered at first because the butler was glad to get out of jail. He was glad to get from under the sentence that was hanging over him. Possibly he could have had execution, but he was uh, saved because God is spared the butler, because the butler is going to be used now to get Joseph out of jail. And it's a marvelous thing how God works. And it's difficult for us sometimes to understand why God doesn't just boom in, just go busting in like that, like a bull in a china shop, and kill everybody and push everybody to one side and say, hey, I'm God. You do it the way I want it done. But God does it gently and easily and systematically. And God does it in such a way that uh, when it's all over, you have to give God the honor and the glory when you take a retrospective view. Now notice what's happening here in uh, this situation. Verse 13, And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was me, the butler, he restored unto my office, and him, the baker, well, he hanged him. The baker got it in the neck, and I got reinstated. I didn't have to go back to the unemployment office. They put me right back to work. But the baker, they hanged him. That's a, a hard way to do it, according to verse 13. 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. It took uh, the hanging of a baker, and it took the imprisonment of a butler, for this thing to maneuver around so God could have it take place and come to fulfillment exactly as God wanted it done. Then what happened? 14, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. That was interesting, wasn't it? They brought him hastily, got him out of there real quick like, and Joseph shaved himself. Rather interesting. He shaved himself. Shaving was a disgrace 
in Palestine, the Jews did not shave themselves. And many other Eastern nations did not shave themselves, but a very strict custom of the Egyptians who detested long beards. The Egyptians couldn't stand a long beard. Well, I personally believe it's because of the hot weather. I don't see any long bearded Egyptians when I've been in Egypt in that over 100 degree weather. Now, whether the, the beard is an air conditioning unit or not, anyhow, the Egyptians didn't go for long beards. But that's uh, <clears throat> the information that I have. Joseph conformed to the prevailing custom and did all he could to be accepted by Pharaoh. He's in jail. He's been there a couple of years. He probably hasn't shaved during that time. He wasn't going anywhere. No point cleaning up or dressing up. He's not going out for dinner. So uh, he probably looked a mess. And all at once, uh, somebody bangs on the prison bars and said, Hey, the king wants to see you. What? The king wants to see me? Get ready. The king wants to see you. So he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in under Pharaoh. He's going to stand before the king. Now, I wonder what uh, Joseph was thinking because he knew that the butler had been put back in the king's palace. He knew that the baker had been hanged, and he wondered, now, what am I going to get out of this? You know, it's like spinning a wheel. You don't know where it's going to stop. It's, and I imagine he was somewhat... Uh, perplexed. Anyhow, he came in under Pharaoh, and 15 says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. That's the most logical thing you would dream, isn't it? A dream. I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. Now, he's saying this to a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. He's saying this to a prisoner that he's had in jail for around two years. I have dreamed a dream, and all my wise men and all of my magicians, all of this intellectual staff that I have here, this committee of brains that work with me, none of them are smart enough to know what it's all about. None of them can interpret it in the middle of verse 15. And I have heard say of thee, in other words, I've heard some folks say that you are pretty clever when it comes to interpreting dreams. Middle of verse 15, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. It's amazing God in old times spoke through dreams. Because in those days they didn't have a written Bible as we have today. So God did come to them in dreams and visions. The Old Testament is filled with that. And here he is having a pagan king, Pharaoh of Egypt, dream a dream. The Egyptians can't help him. And so he has to turn to a Hebrew, a Hebrew who has been instructed in his religion from the day that he was born. Now notice how God gets into the picture in the middle, beginning with verse 16. Beginning with verse 16, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. In other words, what he's saying here, uh, it's not me, it's not my ability, it's my, not my intellect, it's not my uh, intelligence to interpret your dream, but it's God. God is on my side. Egyptians don't recognize God Almighty as the Hebrews do. Verse 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. God will interpret your dream. Had a chance to witness. Daniel had a chance to witness. There's such a beautiful parallel here between Daniel and Joseph. I keep coming back to them because the situation is almost identical. Both of them were in a foreign country. Both of them were in a land where they spoke a strange language. Both of them were in a land where they worshiped pagan gods and idols. Both of them were in a land where they were involved in mysticism and magic and astrology and observing the stars and the planets, the times and the seasons, and all of that kind of garbage. 
See, but here Daniel clung to God. Daniel magnified God. Now Joseph doing the same thing. Middle of verse 16, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 17, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And there's only one river in Egypt, and that's the Nile. When you talk about the river, the river in Egypt, you talk about the Nile. The Nile runs smack dab right through the middle of the country. And everybody in the country of Egypt live on one side of the bank or the other. So he stood on the bank of the river, he says in verse 17, verse 18. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind. These are cows, K-I-N-E. It's an old archaic word. It means cows. It's plural for cows. There came up seven cows. We'll just put it in the modern vernacular. Seven cows came up out of the river. Fat-fleshed and well-favored. And they fed in a meadow. Well, that's normal because on the banks of the Nile, lots of green grass substance for the cows to eat. So he's standing on the bank of the river and all at once in his dream, here come seven cows up out of the river. Verse 19, And behold, seven other cows, or kind, came up after them and this Next or last batch of cows, middle of verse 19, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. This is the worst crop of cows I've ever seen in all my life, Pharaoh said. <laughs> he was really making this thing difficult for Joseph. Uh, he said, we've never raised any cows like that before, their, their hide would hardly hang on them. They were so bony and no meat on them. They were a mess. They were the worst. Verse 20. And the lean and the ill-favored cows did eat up the first seven fat cows. Why? Well, they were hungry. The lean ones ate up the fat ones. And, uh, you know... And he had the magicians out there and they couldn't figure it out. And he had all the wise men he had all of the intellectuals of Egypt, and they couldn't figure this out. I wonder what you would see. You see a, a river, and here comes seven fat cows, well fed, and here comes seven lean ones, and the lean ones go over and eat up the, the seven fat ones. How are you going to interpret that? What would that mean? God has a message, and he has a man to interpret it. Verse 21 and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. But they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I awoke. In other words, the good meal of the fat cows eaten by the lean cows didn't seem to change their uh, condition in any way. They just ate them up. And then he says, I awoke. That was the end of the dream. Verse 22 and I saw in my dream, and behold, this is a second dream. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. Corn, wheat, barley. They have a different kind of grain over there than what we have in the Midwest. When we talk about corn, we think of Illinois and Kansas and places like that where the corn on July 4th is about is supposed to be about 7 or 8 to 10 feet high. And they say that when you go down the, through the fields of corn in July you can hear it popping like popcorn popping. You can hear you can hear the 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 uh the stalks growing and groaning. This is what the farmers tell me out there. The stuff really grows. Well, they don't grow that kind of corn in Egypt. It's a little little tiny corn, very, very small, runty-like. In fact, you would say that that crop's no good. Let's plow it under. But they're glad to get it over there. So here we have seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. They were glad of that in 22. And 23, and behold, seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after that. When the east wind blows over there, you uh, get your tarpaulin out and you, you get yourself lashed down 
because the east wind that blows across that sand-swept area is just like a knife sticking you in the back. That's why they named these uh, German Volkswagen Sirocco. That's a, a wind that blows in the desert, a sandstorm. It's called a Sirocco. And the Germans named their car after this wind that blows in the desert. And so we're getting a little touch of it here. The seven ears were withered, they were thin, they were blasted with the east wind. The Sirocco blasted them, and they sprung up after them, verse 24. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. So all that Pharaoh has done here, he has uh, gotten Joseph out of jail. Joseph has been recommended to Pharaoh that uh, he is qualified to answer and interpret the dream and answer his questions. And now Joseph is sitting in the palace of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh has had him sitting there, and he's told him these two dreams. The fat cows, the lean cows, the fat stalk of corn, and the lean stalks of corn. One good, one bad. One good, one bad. So now we move to the interpretation that Joseph is going to give about this whole affair. And behind it all, you have to remember this. God is overseeing the whole operation. God is in charge. God is going to get the glory and the honor out of this. And God is going to put his man where that man is destined to be. Because Joseph originally was a little shepherd boy in Canaan. And he was not liked by his older brothers, as we have seen in previous lessons. And he was daddy's pet, we might say. If you've ever been in a family where one of the children was a pet, the other children always throw it up to the one that's the pet. Oh, you're daddy's pet or your mother's pet. Mother takes your side or daddy always takes your side. Well, Joseph was daddy's pet, but the brothers got sick and tired of that, so they sold him off down to Egypt. But the reason was that Joseph had had some dreams previously, and Joseph had told his brothers his dreams, and Joseph said, the days will come when you boys will bow down to me. All of you boys will bow down to me. And they said, you're crazy. Can't you see young teenage brothers saying to the one, and they mockingly say, you're a crazy kid. Us bowing down to you, go. But that was God starting the cycle of circumstances that's going to put Joseph as the second in command of all of Egypt. You see, if we, if we don't lose sight of the fact that God is over and above every circumstance, then we're in good shape. But if we forget God, then we don't know which way we're going. But if you can keep your thoughts and your imagination and your desires and your ambitions, and if you can keep all of that anchored in God and rely upon God to bring it to pass, God will bring it to pass. He may not do it exactly like we think. He may not do it when we think it should be done. But it's if, if it's of God, God will bring it to pass. So he's going to take this little shepherd boy from Canaan and he's going to put him in the palace, second in command. Here we go. Joseph's going to give the interpretation, verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Now your two dreams, he says, is just one. It's just those two dreams, let's just boil it all down. It's just one dream. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 26, the seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. 27, and the seven thin and ill-favored or fed cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So what he's telling this great ruler in Egypt, he's saying God Almighty is going to send a famine. 
But God is going to give you seven good years first. And then after the seven good years, then God's going to send seven bad years. And now we don't know what all Joseph said to Pharaoh. It's not recorded. I'm sure he must have said some other things. Joseph must have said to him and advised him, if you're smart, Pharaoh, you'll save up during the seven good years and you'll get ready for the seven bad years. Because when that seven bad years come, it's going to be just like those ill-fed cows. There's not going to be anything growing. And people are going to die by the thousands and people will be out of food and the Nile will dry up. The Nile will not overflow its banks and that rich black silt will not flow down through the Nile Delta and make the rich farming land productive as it has in years past. So if you're smart, you'll get ready for the seven bad years that are coming. Well, you might say I'm adding a little bit to it. No, I think I'm looking between the lines and I'm listening with my good ear and I'm listening to what Pharaoh heard from the mouth of a man by the name of Joseph. Verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. You'll have the most abundant crops you've ever had in the history of your kingdom. Your barns won't be able to hold it. Your granaries won't be able to contain all that you'll grow. There's going to be a tremendous abundance of everything in Egypt for seven years, according to verse 29. Verse 30, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. There won't be anything growing. Nothing will grow at all for seven years. Now that's quite a a revelation and quite an interpretation of a dream to sit in the palace of the king of a great country and reveal to him. Pharaoh's magicians didn't tell him this. And here's a little Jew from the land of Canaan, just a young man, really. He's not an old man. He's a young man, a young Jew, an Israelite, sitting in his palace, telling him what's going to befall them. Verse 31. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. It's going to be the worst famine you've ever had. It's going to be very heavy to bear. And as I said previously in my own remarks, I believe that Joseph must have said to him, Literally thousands of you Egyptians are going to die because during that seven years, there won't be anything. Nothing will be grown. Verse 32. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. In other words, what God uh, did by giving Pharaoh two dreams, he wanted to impress him. He wanted to impress him. So he had him dream the same dream, but in two different ways. God wanted to impress him. This thing is coming. And then you must remember this. I haven't injected this yet in the lesson. God had some Hebrews up in Canaan. And God told Abraham hundreds of years previously, God says, Abraham, I'm going to take care of you and your posterity after you. Don't you worry. And there was a famine also up in Canaan at the same time. And so God is going to make provision for the Israelites, for the Jews, for the Hebrews. And God's going to make provision for them by having a Jew get appointed the prime minister of Egypt so he can be in charge of all the foodstuffs of of Egypt. (laughs) Only God could do that. Just an average human being couldn't do that. God would have to do that. Verse 32. 
And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the, the thing is established by God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. God's impressed you. Now, God's getting ready to bring this thing to pass. Pharaoh must have been impressed by the sincerity of this young Hebrew man. He must have uh, been somewhat taken aback by the super knowledge of this Hebrew young man. Because notice... As we read on, now therefore in verse 33, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. The young Jew is saying to Pharaoh, uh, look all through your kingdom, find a wise man, a discreet man, a man that is able to make decisions, a man who has uh, the knowledge of the land, a man who has the ability to... Uh, do different things on the spur of the moment that will be for your good. You find a man like that somewhere and set him over the land of Egypt. Verse 34. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. This phrase, take up the fifth part of the land, it was customary for landowners to pay a tenth, one-tenth to the king, to Pharaoh. So the advice to double this during the good years was not too great a burden. In uh, Egypt, they had great landowners, and they paid a tax to the king. And so now what Joseph is saying, let's double the tax. And they didn't pay it in money, they paid in grain. And as they grew the corn and the barley and the flax and et cetera, et cetera, they paid a double tax to the king. This is what Joseph is recommending to Pharaoh. And take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. So what he's doing, he's saying, if you really want to survive when the seven bad years come, you need to start making preparations. And during those seven good years, you want to fill every granary, every storeroom, every warehouse. You want to build every warehouse you can possibly build. You want to get every excess facility that you can possibly get. Cram and jam and pack it full of food. Because when the seven years of famine comes, nothing's going to be grown. It's going to be a grievous time. And this is a little Jew, little Hebrew, sitting down there in Cairo, Egypt, talking to Pharaoh. Isn't that marvelous? It's the way God works. God never always, God does use great, intelligent men. But God doesn't always pick great, intelligent men for his jobs. He doesn't pick tremendously intelligent women for his jobs. God picks somebody that's insignificant because it's God that's going to work through them, you see. God doesn't need a lot of brains. God just works through an individual providing that individual's willing. And he had a little Hebrew boy here, little Joseph, who's been sold from his uh, family up in Canaan. Pathetic. He's off down there in a strange land all by himself. But you know, this fellow must have had his devotions. You say, did the people in the Old Bible, and the Old Testament, did they have devotions? Oh, yes. They read the scripture systematically. They read the scripture very conscientiously. And because we read about Daniel, he knelt toward Jerusalem, facing Jerusalem, and he prayed three times every day. Every day. Regardless of the circumstances. So... In the Old Testament, they had devotions. They read the scripture. They had rolls of scripture, scrolls of scripture in those days. They didn't have a Bible like we have, but they had scrolls of scripture. They were educated in the word of God. 
And then the old patriarchs, when they had conversation with men of God, these older patriarchs gave their interpretation and their word of God to a younger patriarch, and that younger patriarch passed it on down the line to younger and younger and younger patriarchs, and the people ate that up. They just loved what they heard from their great-great-great-granddaddy. And they loved it, and they revered it, and they considered it sacred. And this is the man Joseph, verse 36. And Joseph is still advising Pharaoh, and he says in verse 36, And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And all of this was God working, God maneuvering, God bringing it to pass. God was behind the whole thing. This is a thing that comforts me down through the 40 plus years of ministry. I've never been a whopping success at anything I've ever done. But God will have to give me A for effort. Because I've always been on the firing line, always been right there, Johnny on the spot, plugging away. I've preached to some large congregations. I used to preach to 5,000 people at night in the tent. Never changed me, but I've kept my theology straight all of these years, and my perspective is the same today that it was 35 years ago. Hasn't changed. You see, if you incorporate God in your plans, your plans don't change. Your plans may be delayed, they may be slowed up, they may be altered slightly, but ultimately you're plans will culminate according to your desires, according to your inspiration, and according for what you do. And so this all goes back to Joseph as a young shepherd boy in Canaan. And he said to his brothers, he said, you know, fellas, I know you all don't like me because you think I'm dad's pet, but I'll tell you the day will come when all of you will bow down to me. <laughs> they said, you're crazy. You're crazy. And then when they got alone by themselves, they said, that stupid brother of ours, he got the idea that we're going to bow down to him. Who does he think he is? Why, he's nuts. He's crazy. I'll never bow down to him. He's just a stinking little kid. He's just dad's pet. He doesn't know anything about raising sheep and goats. He's always in the tent with dad. But God's going to make them eat their words. You're going to find that a little later on, they're going to go chop, 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 chopping down to Egypt to get corn. Where are they going to go? Kmart? Mm-mm. J.C. Penny? No. Where are they going? They're going to Pharaoh Incorporated. And who's the vice president and the chief administrator of Pharaoh Incorporated? A man by the name of Joseph, who was dad's pet up in Canaan. Oh, there's an interval of several years from the time he left Canaan till he met his brothers down in Egypt. But God was in charge of the whole thing all the time. Can't beat God. Absolutely, under no circumstances, can you beat God. Dr. Estep's next message in the Genesis study series will be heard on the other side of this cassette.